Hello, students of Max 230, uh, Canadian Cultural Industries in Media, and welcome back to our exploration uh, of that topic. Um, and this will be our first uh, video lecture in a series uh, that we'll be using to finish up uh, this term uh, in lieu of face-to-face -face instruction as it has been discontinued for the time being. Um, and I'd like to point out to everybody that uh, as, as a, an accompaniment to this video lecture, um, there is a PowerPoint available under the weekly materials uh, for this week on the Blackboard LMS, um, close to where you uh, found the link for this video, in fact. Now, uh, as I move through this video, uh, I will actually um, verbally uh, indicate when it would be appropriate to uh, move to the next slide in that PowerPoint presentation so that you can follow along uh, by having perhaps the video and the PowerPoint presentation open uh, on whatever uh, platform you're using to view. Uh, but I will also uh, uh, embed uh, the PowerPoint images um, from the uh, uh, presentation, the, the accompanying PowerPoint presentation, right into this video. Um, and so you'll have both resources available uh, to follow along. So today we will be looking at uh, the early Canadian film industry, uh, going back to its earliest contributions in the 20th century, uh, up to and including the era of the Canadian Cooperation Project in the 1950s. And we'll take up more recent Canadian, the more recent Canadian film industry, uh, which was reju rejuvenated in the 1960s in our next lecture. So as I said, I would uh, indicate um, now would be uh, the appropriate time to move to slide two in the PowerPoint accompaniment uh, that goes along with this lecture video. And, uh, you know, going back to even earlier than uh, the beginning of the 20th century, um, in 1879, the first colonial Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Prime Minister John A. Macdonald, introduced Canada's national policy, he called it, a set of initiatives uh, designed to turn the idea of an east-west economy into a reality. And uh, the national policy had um, three uh, particularly important components. Uh, one, one of these was a tariff designed to limit the entry of manufactured goods from the United States and Britain in order to bolster the Canadian economy. Um, but more importantly to us, uh, another of the three was the building of the Transcontinental Ra Railway as part of a colonial nation-building project. Um, and this leads into the third one, uh, which included uh, the national policy efforts to entice immigrants to settle the prairies. So the railway was intended to provide a reliable line of transportation for people and goods across the country. And particularly uh, to move materials uh, from the margins of the country to the industrial heartland in central Canada, where they would be manufactured into goods and shipped back out to market. In other words, uh, the railway was to bind the country into a cohesive political economic unit with what Sir John A. Macdonald referred to as a ribbon of steel. And in Canada, this uh, nationalist project by Sir John A. Macdonald was accompanied uh, by early cinematic compliments. Um, at the time of the earliest cinematic production by the Lumiere brothers and Thomas Edison at the end of the 19th century, um, the first public screening of, of a film in Canada took place uh, on June 28th, 1896 in Montreal. It's an interesting point of history that uh, uh, Montreal seems to be a uh, location in Canada uh, for many media firsts, television, the first television station, the first radio station, and of course the first screening of a public film in 1896. In July of the same year, Andrew and George Holland of Ottawa, Canada's capital, uh, who two, year, two years earlier they had earned uh, uh, opened the, the world's first what was called a kinetoscope parlor in New York City, city featuring uh, Thomas Edison's latest invention, uh, which was called the Vitascope. Uh, and they introduced this to the Canadian public in Ottawa's West End Park. And among the scenes shown uh, was uh, a short film uh, amongst Thomas Edison's many called The Kiss. Um, which was a, a short uh, film amongst many of Edison's, uh, which actually only lasted a few seconds long. Uh, 
Um, and you can actually Google this and find it quite easily uh, on YouTube. It's, it's only it's less than a minute long, I think. Um, but interestingly enough, while you can see from this image, it, it starred uh, William Heiss. It also starred uh, the uh, bouncing beauty May Irwin. Uh, who you can see pictured here, a Broadway actress uh, who was actually Canadian. She was from Whitby, Ontario. So this first screening um, in Ottawa was followed quickly on, on the 31st of August, also 1896 um, uh, of the same year, uh, it, it, uh, for screenings in Toronto. Uh, which took place on Young Street, uh, a famous location in Toronto. And the first screening in Vancouver was in December of 1898. However, uh, you know, even though these first screenings were, were important, it, it's estimated um, that overall, as an overview to today's lecture, that only about 70 Canadian feature films um, uh, were produced during the first half of uh, the 20th century, a statistic that uh, is made even uh, more troubling in its accuracy uh, due to the fact that what is defined as a feature film um, is, is difficult. Uh, for example, uh, the first Canadian films of even close to feature length uh, were produced in the fall of 1897 by a uh, Canadian filmmaker named James Freer. He was a Manitoba farmer, and uh, his films depicted, uh, quite romantically, life on the prairies. In 1898, um, he, he was further sponsored by the Canadian Pacific Railway, the CPR, uh, to tour England with what they called his, quote, home movies, uh, which were collectively entitled 10 Years in Manitoba. And these were so successful that the Canadian federal government actually sponsored a second tour by Freer in 1902. Unfortunately, uh, I would like to direct you to, to the internet for uh, looks at these clips, but excerpts from any of these are nearly impossible to find, uh, and many may have been lost to history, absolutely. Nevertheless, um, I would direct your attention uh, to a documentary that is available on YouTube called um, Canadian Early Film, uh, and I have uh, uh, posted the link to this documentary into the weekly materials uh, where you found this video link as well. Um, and you don't need to watch the whole thing, it's quite long, uh, but it would be important if you watched from about 3 minutes uh, until about 18 minutes. Um, so a cumulative 15-minute uh, viewing time. Um, and I'll ask you to pause and maybe watch that now. Uh, and then um, uh, once you've done that, we'll continue with our uh, lecture. Okay, so welcome back. I hope you uh, took the time to watch that uh, uh, brief excerpt from that larger um, uh, documentary available on YouTube called Canadian Early Film. And if you started it a few minutes earlier, you uh, would have been treated actually, without going to a separate link for it, um, to uh, uh, the, uh, the Kiss, uh, which I mentioned uh, earlier in this lecture. And what you'll notice about even the, um, the examples that were shown in uh, that brief clip um, is that uh, the colonial project of filmmaking was uh, uh, quite obviously very whitewashed. Um, the representation of identities that were outside of the white colonial settler uh, were very rare, uh, in, unless they were in the position of villains or uh, openly considered minorities. Um, and you may have also noticed there was uh, actually an early film made by the CPR filmed uh, right here in the Fraser Valley, um, which was, was a clip. Um, and it's interesting how the media of film itself was broadly concerned with media in general within um, the, the, uh, the melodrama, the black and white melodrama that is demonstrated in that 15 minutes uh, uh, that you watched. Um, it features quite prominently the use of the newspaper, the use of the phonograph. Um, it's part of the social landscape at the time. So uh, it's interesting to know that early uh, media was in early media. And then the CPR continued to produce films promoting immigration right into the 1930s. Um, 
uh, but nothing of as significant uh, to Canadian history as uh, what we saw in that documentary, uh, or certainly Freer's uh, ten, year, uh, ten, 10 Years in Manitoba. So at this point uh, in the lecture, uh, again, I'll invite you um, to proceed now to the third slide in the PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, pictured here already. Um, and after 1912 in, in Halifax, uh, the Canadian Bioscope Company made the first Canadian feature film, uh, which was released in 1913 called Evangeline, uh, based on the Longfellow poem about uh, the expulsion of the Acadians. Now, this company made uh, several other less successful films before folding in 1915. Around the First World War, uh, between 1914 and 1918, um, the first widely released Canadian newsreels appeared. And featured film, uh, feature film production in Canada actually expanded a little, um, as did the Canadian-owned Allen Theatre Chains <clears throat> and associated distribution companies. Um, the Allen Theatre Chains being perhaps the largest and most successful chain of Canadian-owned theatres uh, in Canadian history. So during World War I, uh, the Ontario Motion Picture Bureau, called the OMPB, was the first uh, state-sponsored film organization in the world. This is quite common for nationalist interests now, um, uh, which people generally aren't aware about because of uh, the popularity and widespread knowledge of the Hollywood uh, uh, model. So the Ontario Motion Picture Bureau was founded uh, by the government of Ontario uh, in May of 1917, uh, towards the end of the war. And the, the Exhibits and Publicity Bureau was established by a federal order in council in September 1918 and was renamed the Canadian Government Motion Picture Bureau, the CGMPB, uh, on April 1st, 1923. And this was the, the first national film production unit in the world as well. So Canada uh, holds um, the, uh, the record for the first bureau and the first production unit sponsored by national interests uh, anywhere on earth. So all of this uh, early filmmaking occurred under the footprint of Sir John A. Macdonald's mandate of nation building. And as we've mentioned in several classes now, you know, Benedict Anderson uh, points to such cultural artifacts as, for example, the Daily Newspaper as part of uh, uh, the mass media project that creates imagined cultural communities, in this case, natural, uh, national communities. He says that every reader is well aware that the ceremony he performs is being replicated simultaneously by thousands or millions of others whose existence he is confident of, yet of whose identity he has not the slightest notion. Um, and surely television created this illusory social connection in the late 20th century in the same way, just as the internet does today. <clears throat> and while cinema uh, doesn't maintain the essential uh, social immediacy of either the newspaper or of television, um, like books, uh, which is an artifact that, uh, that Benedict Anderson highlights uh, actually as the precursor to the newspaper, um, cinema is part of the artistic mass media that participates in the construction of these imagined communities. He says, uh, fiction seeps quietly and continuously into reality, creating uh, that remarkable confidence of community and anonymity, which is the hallmark of modern nations he says. Now in Canada, uh, this nationalist project in its earliest manifestations was frequently comprised of efforts to attach the rugged uh, Canadian landscape, the ru this particularly rugged Canadian landscape, to a nationalist identity uh, via cinema. And that would have been apparent in the 15 minutes worth of that larger documentary you watched uh, just minutes ago. Canadian film scholar Seth Feldman refers to this as a propensity to construct an identification of the protagonist with nature in early Canadian cinema. That is to say that the protagonist was sort of positively connected with nature uh, in ways that were quite romantic and celebratory of the Canadian landscape. And similarly, uh, Canadian film scholar Christopher Giddings uh, refers to early melodrama and the ideological cinema of white invasions and settlement. 
Uh, for Giddings, it's especially the case that First Nations, indigenous identities, are figured actually as part of the environment that whites have attained mastery over. So the early representations of First Nations individuals were actually not as characters per se in, in a narrative, uh, but they were really part of the landscape. They were objectified in such a way um, that like the sublime beauty of a mountain was also the sublime beauty of uh, this, the so-called uh, savage. And Giddings regards the same white patriarchal Canadian colonial nationalism to be present in such uh, early Canadian produced feature films uh, as Ernest and Nell Shipman's uh, Northwoods melodrama Back to God's Country from 1919, all the way through to the NFB produced historical drama of the colonization of, of Saskatchewan between 1907 and 1938 in the movie Drylanders, which was itself released actually in 1963. Now in Canada, uh, as elsewhere, of course, there had been uh, very few uh, Canadian uh, directors, very few female directors, sorry. But one exception was Nell Shipman, uh, celebrated uh, by historians as an industry pioneer. She wrote and starred in, or at least she adapted and starred in Back to God's Country uh, from 1919. This was produced in Calgary and, and actually returned 300% profit to its Calgary backers. One of the few films in Canadian history to actually make any money at all, much less uh, three times its cost. And uh, Nell Shipman's uh, groundbreaking nude appearance in the movie, which you can see in the image in the bottom right, uh, it was not particularly titillating. It was, she, she was not exposed in any way because she was in the water, but she was nude. Um, this uh, uh, early nude scene in cinema created quite a scandal. And that certainly represents an early example uh, of how scandal publicity can actually reap significant profits in this case, 300% profit. So on the Blackboard LMS, I've, I've actually uh, um, uh, posted actually a, a link to this film it's well, as well. It, it's a feature length, silent black and white film. Um, and it's not required viewing, but you might take the time uh, to look at a clip or two of it if you're interested. Uh, and if you're further interested, then feel free, free to watch the whole thing. It's actually really quite a good film. Um, but uh, uh, it does take some patience. So at this point in the lecture, uh, I, I would invite you to proceed uh, to slide number four in the PowerPoint presentation. So in the 1920s, uh, in the United States, the major Hollywood studios uh, comprised of Paramount, RKO, 20th Century Fox, MGM, and Warner Brothers they adopted a vertically integrated model of ownership, uh, combining production and distribution uh, under one umbrella. Um, and, and they then included the third sector to production distribution of exhibition. These majors then aligned themselves with the large national theater chains in order to guarantee an outlet for their product, in some cases purchasing theater chains outright and thereby creating uh, an oligopoly of these major Hollywood studios on the entire process of uh, uh, cinematic production from making the film to distributing the film to exhibiting the film. In fact, uh, they were so bold in their powerful domination of Canadian theaters that for the purposes of calculating domestic gross revenue, American distributors actually began including Canada in their bottom line. In 1922, the Canadian Motion Picture Distributors Association, the CMPDA, was formed. Although it was Canadian in name, um, the association really consisted of the Canadian offices of these major American distribution companies. And it was in effect simply a branch uh, of the Motion Picture Distributors Association of America. Um, nevertheless, in 1923, American born uh, uh, an N.L. Nathanson, he was the owner of the Toronto based Famous Players Canadian Corporation, um, but American born. Um, and of course, famous the, the Canadian uh, Toronto-based Famous Players was a company owned by Adolf Zucker's Paramount Pictures. Um, but Nathanson bought all 53 of the Canadian-owned Allen Theatres, which I previously mentioned uh, as the most significant um, Canadian-owned uh, theatre chain in history. 
And in response, also in 1923, the Ontario Motion Picture Bureau, uh, they purchased the Trenton Studios. They purchased their own studios, the first in Canada, uh, operating in Trenton, Ontario, since 1917. And they, they pr uh, purchased these um, from a guy named George Brownridge, who uh, owned Adenac Films, Adenac being uh, less than creative reverse uh, Canada, and began making its own films um, for, for what they called, quote, for the purpose of preserving Canadian traditions. However, uh, the Bureau uh, the, never took steps to develop a domestic film production industry in Canada, even though they had bought these production um, studios. And in fact, they actively discouraged uh, film production in Canada, favoring instead a business model uh, that saw Canada, as I said, really as a branch, branch plant of the American industry. And through the rest of the 1920s, production in Canada was mainly restricted to, to inserts for American newsreels, uh, sponsored short films, and documentaries produced uh, by the government motion picture bureaus and a handful of less than successful private Canadian companies. There was one brief resurgence in 1927 uh, when private investors contributed $500,000 to produce a Carry On Sergeant um, by Canadian film producer Brain, uh, br sorry, Bruce Bairn's father, um, which is relatively celebrated in the history of Canadian film. Um, and there's an image of it uh, in the bottom corner of the PowerPoint slide. Uh, it may be available on YouTube, I'm not sure. Um, so at this point, I'll invite you to proceed to slide five in the accompanying PowerPoint presentation to this video lecture. So as I had said, you know, by the 1930s, the Canadian film industry had become virtually a branch plant of Hollywood. Uh, European film industries, they also faced the threat of Hollywood domination in the 1920s, uh, but most governments uh, moved quickly to protect their domestic industries by controlling ownership of exhibition and distribution companies or by stimulating national production. Um, Canada really took no comparable action for some reason. However, there was uh, one interesting glitch in, in the history. In 1927, um, the United Kingdom uh, released the Cinematographic Film Act, and which actually came into effect in 1928. Now, it was an effort to protect and foster the domestic industry against dominating American imports. Um, it established a minimum percentage of films that had to be shown in Britain, uh, which had to be of British or at least of Commonwealth origin. And the quota was initially set at 7.5% for exhibitors, but it was raised to 20%. In 1935. Now, uh, these uh, British origin films included ones that were shot in British dominions, uh, such as Canada and Australia. And as a result, uh, from 1928 to 1937, there was a total of, of 22 low budget feature films, commonly referred to as quota quickies, uh, produced in Canada by Canadian based although often American financed companies in order to uh, take advantage of the quota, in fact, to, to undermine the quota. Um, film historian Peter Morris, he's concluded that the Canadian government uh, in many ways colluded with Hollywood producers to establish subsidiaries in Canada and thereby uh, circumvent uh, the clear intent of the British quota. Ray Peck, uh, the head of the Canadian Government Motion Pictures Bureau, who was the main emissary of this approach, uh, is held uh, accountable by history for this collusion with Hollywood to undermine the quota. It's an interesting uh, point of history as well that the most active producer of quota quickies, as they're called, was a director named Kenneth Bishop. Uh, from Victoria, B.C. In fact, many of the quota quickies were made uh, in the fledgling cinema industry in British Columbia. Unfortunately, the only memorable feature of this period uh, was The Viking, uh, released in 1931, uh, that late actually, a dramatic depiction of the hazardous life of Newfoundland seal hunters uh, produced in Newfoundland in, in 1930 and 1931 uh, by the American, of course, adventurer of Eric Frissel. Um, and its main claim to fame, actually, is that uh, although it was produced by this American adventurer, um, it was Canada's first talkie, uh, which is the idiom given to uh, films that had dialogue and sound. 
And um, like with some of the other uh, uh, movies mentioned so far, um, the movie uh, The Viking, I have posted a link to the YouTube um, uh, version of this film if you're interested in watching it. Again, it's worth watching at least a few minutes of to sort of get an idea of what the quota quickie caliber was. Eventually, however, the British government became savvy to uh, this undermining of its uh, intention to protect its national film industry uh, with quotas that included films from Canada and Australia. And in 1938, um, the Cinematographic Films Act excluded Canadian production from the quota. Um, and uh, uh, the operation of uh, American interests making quota quickies in Canada really came to quite an abrupt end. Um, so moving forward, again, now it's time to uh, proceed to the sixth slide in the accompanying PowerPoint presentation uh, for this video lecture. So financially hamstrung during the Great Depression, um, which lasted uh, really throughout the entire of the 1930s until it ended in 1939 with World War II, um, the, the Canadian motion picture industry was financially hamstrung. And so even though we had this early uh, talkie in the Viking uh, from 1938, um, or sorry, 1931, uh, the Bureau actually didn't uh, significantly convert to sound films until 1934, by which time it had lost most of its theatrical markets uh, to American talkies that had been being in production for uh, several years. So uh, the, um, the Bureau, the Canadian Motion Picture Bureau, was replaced in 1939 uh, by the creation of the National Film Board, the NFB, by an act of parliament, uh, which officially absorbed the Bureau, in, finally officially absorbed the Bureau in 1941. Um, and the history of the NFB is significant to early Canadian cultural production. In 1938, the federal government commissioned Scottish filmmaker John Grierson uh, who had actually coined the term documentary um, from a film he saw called Moana by Robert Flaherty, whose uh, earliest film uh, um, called Nanook of the North is featured in the chapter reading for this week's lecture. Um, and, and Grierson uh, was uh, commissioned, this Scottish filmmaker was commissioned to study the state of film production in Canada. And he wrote a report that year uh, in 1938 that led to the creation of the NFB in May of 1938. And he was subsequently named the board's first film commissioner in uh, October of 1939. And the National Film Board, as the reading for this week tells us, is guided by a mandate to represent Canada to Canadians. Uh, of course, you can see by this image of Grierson here on the PowerPoint slide, he was typically of the white colonial settler ilk, uh, and representing Canada to Canadians really meant from that specific cultural perspective, while First Nations and other Indigenous perspectives were largely excluded. Now, interesting, though, Grierson felt very much um, that uh, um, making short, inexpensive films about Canadians and their experiences could complement more expensive Hollywood fare and still give Canadians um, some, something of a cinematic presence in the North American landscape of cinema industry. And Grierson also believed that films should tackle social issues and that filmmakers should try to produce films uh, that make a difference. So during World War II, uh, the NFB produced several propaganda films in support of the war effort, uh, and after the war, Grierson returned to England actually in, in shame due to a, a scandal that occurred uh, within the war. But the NFB continued to make uh, really important uh, and successful documentary films. By 1945, the NFB had grown into one of the world's largest film studios, believe it or not, with a staff of nearly 800 people, and it was based in Ottawa. Uh, more than 500 films had been released, uh, including the propaganda series Canada Carries On uh, and The World in Action, uh, before uh, the NFB headquarters would actually shift uh, to uh, Montreal, I believe, in the 1950s. Now, Ross McLean, he succeeded John Grierson as commissioner in 1945, 
Um, and he had a bit of a different tack than Grierson did. McLean had suggested uh, that, um, although he was a Canadian-minded, in that he suggested that Americans should begin to recognize a certain responsibility uh, in terms of Canada because of their domination of uh, the, the theatrical market. And quotas were mentioned, quotas within, uh, the, like Britain had a minimum number of British films that had to be uh, uh, screened in their theaters, quotas for the screenings of a minimum number of Canadian films in these American-owned theatrical venues in Canada were mentioned, um, but none were put in place. Canada has a long history of suggesting a minimum quota of Canadian films in these largely American corporate-owned theatrical venues uh, and failing to uh, implement or enforce them in any significant way. Um, by 1947, there were two large theatre chains in Canada, Famous Players and Odeon Theatres, uh, while Canadian in ownership only superficially because of the American interests behind them. And Canadian films were virtually frozen out of their own market. And most of the theatrical revenue, uh, approximately 17 to $20 million annually, was just bleeding out of Canada into the United States. After the Second World War, which ended in 1945, Canada, like many countries, experienced a balance of payments problem with the U.S., so as a result, in 1947, the federal government restricted imports on a large number of goods. Uh, money made on films uh, uh, that were screened in Canada was discussed. And again, there was a rejuvenated talk of some kind of quota system um, that could be conceived to force Hollywood to invest at least part of its box office profits back in Canadian film production, if not a quota system for uh, theatrical presentation. Um, and in February of that year, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation leader M.J. Coldwell proposed in the Canadian House of Commons that the federal government impose a protective tariff on Hollywood films exhibited in Canada. Unfortunately, later that year, Liberal Finance Minister Douglas Abbott met with famous players and the Canadian Motion Pictures Distributor Association, keeping in mind that it, it was largely run by American interests, and asked them again to voluntarily invest some of their box office profits from the Canadian exhibition market in Canadian production facilities. And you can uh, imagine uh, how willing these American corporate interests uh, were to voluntarily invest money in what they considered to be a losing production market. So instead, uh, the president of the Motion Picture Associations of America, the MPAA, Eric Johnston, intervened. And he proposed uh, what, what came to be known as the Canadian Cooperation Project which was approved by the Liberal government of Louis Saint Laurent in 1948. Now, the Canadian Cooperation Project, which, as you can see from the accompanying PowerPoint slide, it lasted between 1948 and 1958. And it was a notorious agreement, a huge mistake on the part of the Canadian government, in which the government actually pledged to the United States industry uh, not to promote the growth of a Canadian commercial film industry in exchange for Hollywood's promise to mention Canada in as many of its films as possible in the hopes of boosting tourism to Canada. And these mentions were very stilted and very contrived. Of course, the, the stereotype Mountie in his red outfit and wide-brimmed hat, uh, as well as uh, strange uh, references to the Canadian landscape. And so, as a result of the Canadian Cooperation uh, Project, Feature, feature film production in Canada uh, during the 1940s and 1950s was, was largely moribund. There was virtually no feature film production in Canada outside of Quebec, which was producing its own feature films in French language for its domestic audience. In fact, uh, really, there was only uh, one English-Canadian feature film made in all of the 1940s uh, called Bush Pilot, uh, released in 1946, which was little more than an imitation of Hollywood's uh, Captains of the Clouds from 1942. And in this period, actually, there, there arose a tradition of Hollywood borrowing from Canadian film and Canada borrowing from Hollywood film, as we'll see um, as we uh, move into 
um, our discussion of later National Film Board of Canada productions. Uh, and at this point, in order to do that, I will uh, invite you to proceed to slide number seven in the accompanying PowerPoint presentation to this video lecture. So during this period of the Canadian Cooperation Project, um, in instead of in the stead of uh, feature film production, which the Canadian government had agreed not to produce or at least not to promote, uh, were a series of influential experimental films out of the uh, now uh, maturing studios of the National Film Board of Canada. And a really interesting 1950s contribution uh, to these films uh, demonstrates um, the proximity that the Canadian film industry had uh, and the influence of U.S. filmmaking. Um, there were two uh, films that came out both in 1950. One of them was an NFB production called Gentleman Jekyll and Driver Hyde. Uh, and another one was out of the Disney Studios called, uh, was Goofy in Motor Mania. Now, again, both of these came out in 1950. And uh, research, at least superficial, cursory research on the internet, it's very hard to tell which one was produced first. And although the history of either makes no significant reference to the other, uh, if you watch them back to back, you'll be, I think, astonished at how uh, nearly identical their plot lines are. Both of them uh, deal with, uh, both of them are, are in some ways a warning, a, a sort of a didactic harbinger of the dangers of becoming too uh, emotionally uh, uh, virulent, shall we call it, uh, while driving and, and not paying due attention to the safety of the people around you. Now again, I have posted links uh, to the YouTube entries uh, of both of these uh, uh, films. They're both quite short. Um, and I'll really encourage you to watch uh, both of them. Watch them back to back, in fact. Uh, and I think you'll be astonished uh, at how similar the content and subject matter is. Um, and uh, isn't it an interesting uh, history, uh, sort of inquiry left to history to discover which one uh, stole from the other? Because almost certainly... One of them did. Now, other contributions uh, to these experimental films coming out of the NFB during the era of the Canadian Cooperation Project, they had more left-leaning socialist implications, certainly had apocalyptic characteristics. Um, and one of the most famous was uh, by um, rising uh, uh, NFB animator, a guy named uh, Norman McLaren. Now, he made dozens of films, if not hundreds, for the NFB. And uh, one of his most famous, though, was called Neighbors, released in 1952. Um, and he was using stop motion animation, live actors, but using the same processes of stop motion in order to create some um, quite interesting special effects, which were really avant-garde in their time. And I think it's worth you taking the time um, to, again, uh, go to the link posted to the weekly material uh, for uh, on the Blackboard LMS for this week's lecture, uh, where I have put up a link to uh, Norman McLaren's short film, Neighbors, significant uh, for many reasons. And others worth mention here uh, include uh, films uh, by Ar uh, Arthur Lipset, who uh, his most famous contributions are Very Nice, Very Nice from 1961, and another one called 2187 from 1964, a film that significantly influenced George Lucas uh, in the production of Star Wars, and that's why the number 2187 emerges in the earliest film a couple of times, uh, as well as Michael Snow, who uh, produced a Canadian film in this era called Wavelength, a bizarrely experimental avant-garde film, uh, which is about 40 minutes of increasing cacophonic noise uh, on a static camera that slowly zooms from one end of a room to another. That's a little bit difficult to watch, also available on YouTube, but not listed here. Now, the NFB, uh, for these uh, uh, contributions, especially during the era of the Canadian Cooperation Project, won more than 5,000 international awards, including a dozen Academy Awards. Um, nevertheless, the creation of the NFB did very little to solve the problem posed by the dominance of foreign, particularly American, films in Canadian theatres. 
and nevertheless one but there was one uh, um significant historical advent that did take place during this period um in fact early into the cooperation project is the canadian film awards which were established in 1949 and of course they would uh, um, evolve into the genie awards in 1980 and then into the canadian screen awards in 2012. By 1957, uh, the balance of payments problem was no longer an issue in the Canadian, uh, um, the, their fund, international funding between the two countries, and the protective tariff uh, was no longer a threat. And the Canadian Cooperation Project, now realized by the Canadian government as a bit of an embarrassment to its own cinema industry, was quietly terminated in 1958. Nevertheless, the neglect that films, uh, the film industry suffered, the feature film industry at least suffered in Canada uh, during this period, really set Canada back against American production interests, which continued evolving and becoming more sophisticated during this period. And uh, it persuaded, uh, you know, at least one significant Canadian film director, a guy named Fury, to emigrate to Britain in 1960, uh, where he, in an interview to the British press, explaining why he had moved his production uh, of films from Canada to the UK, said um, that he want he said I wanted to start a Canadian film industry, but nobody cared, um, which may be characteristic of uh, the Canadian uh, response to film production throughout the 20th century, which resulted in a rather moribund uh, um, industry, at least until the Renaissance in the 1960s. The Fury was typical of the immigration of English-speaking filmmaking talent from Canada. Uh, as, a, as a result of the Canadian Cooperation Project, a lot of filmmakers actually uh, left the country to go to more welcoming climes where the governments and the industries um, were supporting uh, feature film production in a much stronger way than Canada had agreed not to uh, with the United States. Um, but even into the feature film renaissance in the 1960s and 1970s and beyond, um, the NFB uh, experimental tradition that really rose to the fore during the Canadian uh, um, cooperation project has maintained with um, a number of, uh, uh, well, dozens, hundreds even, of celebrated films, uh, a few of which I foreground here in this PowerPoint slide, including uh, The Log Driver's Waltz, uh, Waltz, released in 1979, uh, which became a, a sort of established squiggle vision as an aesthetic of animation, which was taken up again uh, by The Big Snit, and it released in 1985, and you can see an image of The Big Snit in the bottom right of this uh, PowerPoint presentation slide, um, and I think uh, I've po I'm going to be posting a link to this one on the uh, Blackboard LMS as well. Uh, also using Squiggle Vision, and it's about uh, a sort of petty and petulant uh, a couple living in an apartment who are so um, self-absorbed in their their petty squ marital squabbling that they uh, don't pay attention to the nuclear holocaust occurring outside of their windows. Uh, and they finally reconcile and emerge uh, into some sort of a utopian heaven outside of their front door. And uh, last, the last one I want to mention is uh, what I was intending to screen uh, in our class today. Um, and I will definitely be posting a link to this one. And there may well be questions uh, on the final quiz uh, in relation to this. So I will expect you to watch this 30-minute NFB film from 1965 called The Rail Rotter. Now in The Rail Rotter, not only um, does it star uh, uh, at this point in history aging American actor Buster Keaton, interestingly in an NFB production in his second last film before he passed away, um, but Sir John A. Macdonald's ideological mandate of uh, uniting Canada with the railroad across the country and the NFB mandate of representing Canada to Canadians uh, is certainly alive and well as late as this uh, 1965 production. And when you watch it, you'll notice the colonial footprint in Canada uh, of its colonial history is in extreme evidence. The film actually begins in Britain um, where uh, the lead character, 
quote, emigrates to Canada by, by what seems to be swimming across the ocean, which would be how the colonial settlers did come across, come across the Atlantic Ocean and arriving on the east coast of Canada. Um, and it begins with the stereotyping of First Nations uh, and Asian characters as well. The First Nations are represented uh, as part of the landscape uh, in the opening montage. And then the A Asian characters are, are reflected even in the very narrative form. Um, uh, so what we see is after the whole film uh, travels across Canada on the railroad celebrating its visual landscape um, and we see the First Nations framing the, um, the, these representations of First Nations identities in Canada, very stereotyped representations framing the beginning of the film. Uh, then when he gets to the West Coast, we have a stereotyped representation of an Asian character uh, framing the other end of the film. That is to say that the First Nations and the Asian identities in Canada are pushed to the margins of the beginning of the end, just that they are culturally. And perhaps most importantly, the film betrays uh, a certain uh, unique Canadian masculinity, still very white and colonial, um, celebrated through its connection to the regional landscape. But the hero of the film is uh, a sort of a, a wimpy and quirky, uh, idiosyncratic, older white man uh, who is then connected visually to the landscape and his ability to be creative as he moves through it on the railroad in contradistinction to what had become the stereotype of American uh, movie star, you know, the macho hero uh, masculinist uh, who could solve any problem and overcome uh, any obstacle. And yet the American media dominance is also in evidence in this film the main character is performed by American uh, uh, cinema star Buster Keaton, not by any one of the available Canadian actors who, who might have starred in it. Um, and so all of these characteristics, the railroad, the landscape, the strange version of Canadian masculinity connected to the landscape, the marginalization of First Nations and Asian identities, um, and the uh, subservience to the American market dominance all come together in this great NFB production, which I think you'll find quite fun, and uh, I will leave it with you uh, to watch. So with that being said, uh, I'll conclude this video lecture uh, for week 10 of our course in Canadian cultural industries in the mass media. And I will invite everyone during these strange times uh, that are barring us from having face-to-face -face instruction to stay safe and take care uh, and enjoy your viewings as they are made available through the links on the Blackboard LMS. And uh, I will look forward to uh, continuing this uh, brief series of lectures uh, with our continued discussion of the Canadian film industry next week.